Join us as we dive into the history, hauntings, and high strangeness of the world to try to better understand the paranormal. I will be your guide. I am paranormal researcher and investigator Eric Freeman Sims. Welcome to the Unseen Paranormal Podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Uh, sorry for the long hiatus, but it is great to be back. I uh, have been recording episodes behind the scenes the past few months, so got some episodes in the bank, got some awesome guests I'm excited to bring to y'all. Today, we have an amazing guest. Before we get to that, um, if any of y'all don't know, me and my husband bought a 200-year-old haunted house um, in Hopkinsville, Kentucky in April, and we I took the hiatus from the show here to have a little more time to work on that, work on the website, and build all that up and build that part of our business up. And uh, it is open for private history tours. You can give me a call. My number is on the website, and we can set up a private history tour. Um, also, we have it open to paranormal teams for half night investigation, overnight investigation. The half night is three hundred fifty bucks, uh, and the overnight is five hundred dollars. You can go on the website. It is the nighthouseky.com dot com, and uh, night is spelled K N I G H T. And if you're not following us on Facebook, please go follow the Facebook page as well. And uh, it's not only paranormal stuff, but we're putting all the re- uh, renovation stuff up there too that we uh, that we do. And uh, you can continue to see the evolution of the house. We've done a lot in the five months that we've owned it, and uh, it's been going good. We've got teams in the house coming in the house, and the and the par- the paranormal is off the chain, man. They are ready to talk. I'm telling you. But yeah, go on the website and you can book uh, a t- your team if you don't have a team and don't know how to investigate, but you would like to ghost hunt the house. You can do that with me. We're gonna we got a bunch of um, three hour guided ghost hunts, and uh, you'll investigate with me the whole three hours. And the first two hours uh, with you and your group will uh, be investigating with me. The last hour you get to go investigate by yourselves, and I'll be there to still help. And I have all the equipment you can play with, and all the things you've seen on TV, and all that good stuff. So um, have a good time and uh, get to learn the history of the house as well as experience the hauntings, hopefully. Uh, but today we have Mr. Stanley Milford Jr. He is a paranormal ranger for the Navajo Nation. And uh, the Navajo Nation, if you don't know, encompasses uh, four or five states out in the Midwest, and it is uh, where skinwalkers come from. Him and his partner, Jonathan, were tasked by their boss um, as Navajo rangers to be the two that that, uh, investigated all of the paranormal goings on on the reservation. So anything to do with skinwalkers, witchcraft, ghosts, Bigfoot, aliens, they investigated all of it. And now Stanley has written a book that is uh, coming out October 1st, and it is already on the New York Times top 22 books to read this fall. So look for it to be a New York Times bestseller. He's a great guest. Uh, we're going to have him on again uh, to tell more of his stories. Uh, he he wanted to do that. He said he, we only got the tip of the iceberg. So uh, look for a part two uh, sometime in the near future. But sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode. And I'm so happy to be back. Thank y'all for listening. Thank y'all for sticking with us. And we'll talk again soon. Have a good day. Uh, hey, Stan. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Oh, sure. Sure. Glad to be here. Yeah, like I was telling you before we started recording, I, I was excited when your publicist reached out um, because, uh, for one, this is a different type of book than most of the paranormal books. I, I like how you wrote it from a uh, biographical standpoint as well. It's not just a bunch of stories. And I like it because I think the journey – most of the time is just as important as the destination. So I know people want to get to like the paranormal stories and things, but, uh, but I think the journey is just as interesting. I, I agree with you. You know, the fact that you and I are sitting here talking for a podcast is part of that journey. And yeah. I think that, you know, all of us that have an interest in that subject matter are on this journey. Um, it's, it's leading somewhere. And um, I think it's a very important journey we're taking. So, yeah. 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 And uh I like how you put your your life story in there too because it shows how life and and the creator or god or whatever you want to call it was kind of it seems like was kind of um training you to ultimately become the paranormal ranger um throughout all the experiences through your life. Uh it seems like you're being you're being prepared as a kid to be a police officer and then go on to be a Navajo ranger and then go on to do the the paranormal cases. Yeah. Well, there's so many things that have transpired that have come into play for you and I to be sitting here today. And for me, a lot of it, you know, it wasn't really planned. If those, if the two young rookie rangers you read in the book hadn't uh, botched 
the response to the elderly woman that had a uh, that was claiming to have a Bigfoot take one of her sheep, then John Dover and I would have never been assigned to to yeah. take these kind of cases. And there's things like that, just on and on that you know that things that happened and things that fell into place for this whole this whole thing to to transpire and to be where we are today. Yeah, I feel that way in life too. Sometimes that uh that you just feel like you're being steered in the right, right direction, and kind of if you get off course, then it kind of has a, a way of correcting itself to put you where you're supposed to be. Yeah, self correcting. Yeah, exactly. So you start off life kind of with your foot in two different two different cultures and two different worlds. Uh, one in the Na- Native American world and kind of one in the Western world. That's very true, and that plays a significant role in how all of this came together. So. I was born on the Navajo Reservation, and my mother and father, I had an older sister, five years older than me. Her name is Deborah. And when I was about two years old, my mother and father separated, and we were living on the Navajo Nation at that time. And my mother took me and my older sister back to uh, where she was from uh, in Oklahoma, a little town called Tahlequah, Oklahoma, which is the capital of Cherokee Nation. So I grew up predominantly living there in Tahlequah and in the surrounding area. I would school there from first grade all the way through graduating high school. But my father would fly me and my older sister usually every summer from Tulsa, Oklahoma, out to Albuquerque. And my father would pick us up and we would spend time there on the Navajo Reservation with all our relatives there, my father's family. And so, like you said, I was kind of steeped in both cultures. In Oklahoma, I went to public school. And yes, there were Native American students. I mean, Oklahoma was Indian territory before it became a state. So you have a number of different Indian tribes from the state of Oklahoma. And so I went to public school and I was there with all of the other students. You know, we had a really diverse student classroom. I would say that probably the majority were white, but the second part of that would probably be Native American. And then you did have black and you had Asian. So it was very diverse. I always felt included in in everything that I did growing up there in Oklahoma. And so I went to school there. My father would bring me and my older sister out to the Navajo Reservation, and I got to experience Navajo culture and the foods and everything that goes with that. The the tales of shapeshifters and skinwalkers, so that was there. But one of the unique things about the investigation of the paranormal for the Department of Resource Enforcement or the Navajo Rangers was that At the time, the chief ranger, he, the way he ran his department was that he felt that as sworn law enforcement officers, we were there to either help people or protect people. Uh, And that was your primary job. It didn't matter that we were investigating things of paranormal or, you know, or other. It's just the fact that these people needed help and they were reaching out to somebody and typically when people experience these things that fall under the paranormal umbrella they aren't given very much attention by your local law enforcement right the, the police departments and sheriff's departments and the other thing is most agencies today are under staff under under man and so they're busy dealing with the day-to-day domestic violence and other daily calls. But because this comes from the Navajo Nation, you have the cultural aspect of of a Native American tribe. And within that, you know, you'll have your you'll have your medicine men that do practice certain ceremonies and things like that uh, for healing purposes. And it's a part of the culture. It's, It's it's very much a part of the culture. Yeah. Within that, you also have 
with that particular tribe, you have an element of witchcraft that's involved. And this is a very real part of the reality of that culture. And, and same with some of the tribes there in Oklahoma. You know, I had grown up there in Oklahoma hearing my relatives talk about stories of shape shifting and, um, even in Oklahoma, but, but it was a little bit different than what I'd heard on the Navajo reservation. And, uh, so it's kind of back and forth, but also my partner, Jonathan Dover, he grew up being born and living in Los Angeles. And then he spending time with his grandparents on the Navajo reservation. His, his grandfather was a medicine man. And so he would be back and forth between those two locations. And there again, he was able to view these cases that we dealt with of paranormal from both sides, from both sides of that coin. Yeah. Uh, the Western side and then the traditional and, and cultural side. The same was with our chief. Chief was born on the reservation. He was raised in, on the reservation. But when he was a little boy, he was taken to back to uh, Salt Lake City uh, and and he went to school through the Mormon church up in up near Salt Lake City and so he too also was able to view these cases and this phenomenon of paranormal from both sides and it, so that the coming together of uh, those three individuals made it unique because the average ranger that I worked with Having been raised on the reservation their entire life, the taboos uh, were so strong that in the Navajo culture, you don't deal with anything that has to do with death or or the witchcraft or things of that nature. So anything involving those kind of things, they would avoid. And for me and John, we, we didn't. You know, we were we were able to look at it from... Uh, Western perspective and to focus on what it is that we had as an objective for our job. So, yeah. Um, I think that really set the foundation for the investigation of these paranormal cases. Yeah. And kind of made you and him mm -hmm. uniquely qualified and the chief to, uh, right. to deal with those type of cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and exactly growing up here in the, the stories and the beliefs of the Navajo, you kind of, didn't buy into it at first, uh, a lot of the stories to where it's like your cousins and, and people growing up on the, on the reservation did. And, um, what made you come around to start believing somewhat in, in some of the stories and things you've been told? Well, you're correct in that. And that when I was growing up in Oklahoma, you know, I'd hear these tales of shape shifting and stuff, but that's what I took it as stories, storytelling. So I had, uh, I had graduated high school. I had gone and graduated from the Haskell Indian Nation College at the time. It's now a university in Kansas. And I had come home during the summer into Arizona, and I was staying with my father. And I had gone to the movie theater one night to watch a movie, a Stephen King movie about uh, these. It was a tractor trailer that actually came to life because of um, a meteor that passed close to earth and there yeah. was a AC dc soundtrack and i was big into the hard rock and heavy metal during my you know even today i, I still love that kind of music but anyway i had this ac dc soundtrack so i went to the movies by myself and when the movie was over it was, it was around midnight sometime and when i came into the lobby there was an elderly man that was sitting there on one of the benches and he, him and I ended up talking and he asked if he could catch a ride back to the town that I was, uh, I lived in, which was about seven miles away. And, um, so him and I got in the car and I took him to where he wanted to be taken. And it was, it was in an area where there's no street lights or anything like that. It was very dark where he asked to be let out. And I was, it was kind of, you know, kind of unnerving letting this elderly man that was probably in his 80s out in this area. 
Yeah. And where I let him out, there was a long stretch of highway. So I turned around and I started back down, down that straight stretch of highway going back to the house. Um, and I was, as I was driving, uh, out the passenger window, there was something that caught my eye, something moving. And I continued to glance in that direction to kind of see what this was. At first, I assumed maybe that it was a horse or something running on the inside of the fence. But pretty soon, whatever this was, was able to leap that uh, right-of-way fence, the barbed wire right-of-way fence that runs parallel to the road. And this thing moved closer and closer to the car. It ended up getting within a couple of feet of the car, two or three feet from the car. And this thing was, its body form or shape appeared a lot like a greyhound, but much bigger or kind of more robust than that. It had this thick barrel kind of chest. It was running on all fours. It was all white from head to toe. And it was keeping up with me at, at the highway speed. So I kept looking over to try to see what, what this was. And at one point, I look over that way and it's looking right at me. And its eyes were this fluorescent orange color, like what you see on the exit signs of a movie theater. Yeah. It was a really intense, bright color, like it was had its own self illumination. And this thing had these eyes, it had a mouthful of teeth, its head was canine in shape, much like what is portrayed in the movies with the werewolf. So I'm looking at this thing and we're looking at each other. And at one point I just slid down on the seat as far as I could, the driver's seat and barely seen over the dash. And uh, I floored it. I didn't look back at it. I didn't look in my rear view mirrors. I don't know what it did at that point. But yeah, seeing that thing was like ice water in your veins. It was, it was nothing I ever seen before, and and since. Um, yeah. And it was one of those life changing experiences you had. But you know, I'll never forget that. As long as I live, I when I close my eyes, I can still see its eyes and how they look, and this mouthful of teeth, and it was very menacing, and how this thing was able to keep up with me at sixty five or more miles an hour. I don't know. Right. So that road comes to a T. I don't know how I made it around the corner there because I was flying and I come sliding into the driveway at the house, jumped out, ran in the house. I was kind of out of breath and my dad was still awake. He was sitting up recliner and he said, what, what's wrong with you, son? What happened? And I described what I'd seen and he said, he said, son, that's a, that's the skinwalker. That's what you've seen. And at that point, you know, I knew all of the stories I'd heard about these things wasn't just make believe. It, these, these things were real. I didn't know what I'd seen. And it was in a physical form right there, a couple of feet away from me, you know. And um, so I knew that um, at that point, this stuff was real, you know, and not just legend not just fable not just a story but it really that these things were real yeah and, and that's there's no case of mistaken identity there i mean especially since it was keeping up no. with you at 60 70 miles no. an hour right well the other thing that coincided with that was i was really close to one of my cousins out there um, Matt, one of my navo kids he and i were about the same age i think we were only months apart in with our birthdays and and when that happened, he was, he was killed. He was killed in an accident. And my aunt, his mother, uh, sought out help from a medicine man. And the medicine man performed some ceremonies and stuff. And he said that my cousin's death was related to me seeing what I, that thing running by my vehicle. Wow. So, yeah pretty serious stuff yeah and it's kind of uh from what i understand it's kind of taboo in the in the navajo culture to even talk about skinwalkers because it they think it brings on uh things like that well the commonality and all of these things i investigated 
under the paranormal, be it UFOs, extraterrestrial, Bigfoot, hauntings and spirits, and the witchcraft. The commonality was that in one of the cases I investigated, there was coins that would apport or fall out of thin air into the floor. And sometimes the coins would fly across from the top corner of the room. Uh, sometimes they would hit us. And in that particular case, there was 66 coins over the course of two days, a two-day investigation. Wow. And that was, again, another one of those things when you actually witness this phenomenon happening right in front of your eyes. Right. Right there in front of your eyes, a coin materializing out of nothingness. No, nothing there. Thin air falling maybe three feet high to the floor. You realize that the, this idea of other dimensions and other planes of existence, that there's something to that. And I, be, you know, it's like an epiphany or a light bulb going up on above my head where at that point, at that moment, I realized that all, that was how all these things were connected. The UFOs come into our environment and atmosphere from some other plane of existence. The Bigfoot, you know, me and John had lived in the woods at times on the reservation. You know, the Navajo Reservation is 27,000 square miles. Yeah. That's the size of the state of West Virginia. Uh, yeah. The biggest part is in Arizona, and then New Mexico, Utah, and now Colorado. Uh, Navajo Nation has some ranches in Colorado today. but that's a vast area and John and I had spent a lot of our career out in the woods, the forest areas on the reservation. We could see the evidence of all of the wildlife, the bears, the mountain lions, bobcats, coyotes, all of these things, you could find the evidence of them living in that environment. Yeah. Um, you know, you'll find where they have their dens and bed down and and where they have routes to get water during the day or at night, um, where they hunt, you'll see all of that. And, and you'll see where they poop and everything. But with the Bigfoot, you don't see that. You know, people are witnessing it. People are having these encounters, but you don't see that evidence of these things living in the woods. And I know there are some investigators that have a different viewpoint in that where they do think they migrate and this kind of thing but yeah i i can't follow that line of thought simply because of the evidence that's, that's there in the woods and so i feel that these like the bigfoot are either being they either cross over from some other dimension into our physical world and we see them they leave the tracks and the hair and different things and and then they cross back over, and then people are running around trying to find out, where did he go? Where did he go? <laughs> right, and, right. And, you know, John and I investigated cases where we would have tracks that start at one point and go out for miles. And then all of a sudden, it, the last track, it ends. And there's no, you know, there would be no disturbance within the corridor in and around those tracks. No disturbance. Yeah. And that that repeated itself, you know, over and over. So I started thinking about the theory that these things, they're not living out there. They're not, you know, they're not wildlife. They come into our physical world for whatever reason. Maybe the extraterrestrial are putting these things that are built like a tank here on Earth to gather information, and then they bring them back to where they originate. Um, the Bigfoot is built like a tank. I mean, no matter where you put that, that uh, Bigfoot on this planet, be it, you know, in alpine locations or like the swamp ape down in Florida or in the south or the Yowie, you know, this thing could survive. Even if it got into a, a altercation with a grizzly bear, these things could probably survive that. Yeah. Uh, simply by how they're built and how they're commonly described. So. Yeah, I mean, that was kind of the epiphany that I had with the coins. You know, it was one of those, again, life-changing experiences that made me realize there's a hell of a lot more to our universe than what's right here in front of us with us 
going to and from work each day and paying bills and getting kids to school and those kind of things that we get caught up with, you know, yeah. there's more to it than that. And uh, I've been blessed to experience these paranormal phenomena and know that this stuff is real. I've, I've seen it. Not all cases. Yeah. I, John and I have uh, uh, found, you know, a number of people hoaxing some of this stuff over the years and, and uh, there is a lot of that today, simply because you've got AI that can manipulate photographs and and the internet and things of that nature that people yeah. can use to manipulate the media to make it look like it's real. And it does look real, but it's it's being faked. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, when you when you get when you get money involved, exactly. You know, with it, clicks and yeah. things like that, and YouTube paying people, yeah, exactly. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, within within your department, y'all kind of had a unwritten rule about Bigfoot about not shooting at them, right? You know, anytime a law enforcement officer is put in a situation to have to potentially use deadly force, that's a huge thing. I mean, that's the the biggest thing. You're, you're given the authority to use deadly force in the day-to-day duties you know of your authority and to me yeah. i was a federal firearms instructor for almost all of my career so john and i and john too john and i taught the qualifications and training and john and i also worked swat we were the commanders for our swat team and uh so we we took that you know that was the 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 greatest authority we had you know and we didn't take that lightly and the fact that you know when you do have these hoaxers um you as a law enforcement law enforcement officer you would not want to end up using deadly force against one of these things and and go up to it and it's got a zipper on the back and there's somebody inside you know and that would be the worst worst thing in the world and uh so in in the use of deadly force, you only use deadly force um, in a situation where your life or the life of somebody else is, is compromised or at risk. And, and that's the only reason you would use deadly force. You, you are required to use a lesser means of force if it is possible to control that situation. So... Only unless one of these things were attacking you and uh, or someone else and you had to defend your life or someone else's would you use deadly force. So, yeah, there was there was an unwritten um, policy about those kind of things. You know? So you were a Navajo Ranger. You became a Ranger. Right. And what is the difference between that and like a regular tribal police or like local, well, local police? Well, the Department of Resource Enforcement slash Navajo Ranges, is situated under the Division of Natural Resources. So the Navajo Rangers is kind of a catch-all law enforcement department that would also do the work of your fish and wildlife conservation officer, your forestry officers, your livestock and agriculture officers, and even the Navajo police officers. So let's say a ranger is at the one of the remote lakes checking fishing permits or something, and he comes across a domestic violence in progress. You know, he's got to take action on that. So he yeah. had the authority, like a police officer, to make a arrest and detain that person and and uh, either have a Navajo police officer come to the location and, and and transport the individual or some cases we would make the arrest and transport that person into the detention or whatever. But um, it's not that we were, and and some of us like work parkers, we were trained to run radar and issue traffic citations and things like that. Um, And, and again, like I'd mentioned, John and I worked SWAT. We were trained as SWAT personnel and, um, so when there was a call for a possible school shooting or things like that, we responded to those kind of calls. And um, 
you know, we dig the dignitary protection under the special projects unit and we did security for like the motion pictures and filming on the Navajo reservation. You know, they would have like Johnny Depp uh, there filming, you know, the Lone Ranger or something like that. And they would need a law yeah. enforcement presence and security there. So we would be detailed to, to do this kind of thing. So the band Metallica, I did security for one time. Um, you know, a lot of different things. Dignitary protection, we did, John and I did security for the first Navajo woman that ran for the Navajo pres- pres- presidency. When they were campaigning, you know, out there on the reservation, John and I were the ones that were her law enforcement security and uh, dignitary protection. So there, there was an incident where um, there was two young rangers that were dispatched to a call that came in. There was an elderly grandmother in what was what's known as sheep camp, which is a high elevation mountain area. The elders will herd their sheep up into the mountains during the summer months. Because up there in the mountains, it's a lot cooler and it's greener. There's a lot of water and your livestock can graze up there. And this elderly Navajo grandmother had called the department saying that she witnessed one of these things that people refer to as a Bigfoot had stepped over into her sheep corral, taken one of her sheep and took off with it. And so... There was two young rangers that were assigned to that particular case. One of these rangers, I like to refer to him as a comedian (laughs) because he's always joking, (laughs) always laughing, always carrying on. You know, it's, it's just part of his personality. And I think the grandmother overheard him carrying on back at the either the sheep corral or back at the patrol unit. And I she, think she took offense to this. I think she thought that he wasn't being serious about this case. So she contacted the chief ranger back and and probably let him have it as far as, as a Navajo grandmother could. So he called it, the chief called a department wide meeting and he he said you know, these cases that we get that fall under what is known as paranormal or supernatural. He said, yes, you may not understand it. You may not believe it, but you will investigate these cases like any other case, just as professional as you do any other case. Because, yeah, yeah, you might not believe it, but to these people that are experiencing it, for the most part, they're traumatized. Right. Yeah, it's real to them. It's very real to them. And that's what he said. He said, it doesn't matter whether it's an elderly person or even a child, you know, it's very real to them. So you chose to stand behind a badge and gun and you chose to do one of two things, and that's to either help people or in some cases to protect people. And he said, you will do that. If you don't want to do this, there's other jobs that you can can do. And he said, we will do this because these people need help. They're reaching out for help. And for most law enforcement agencies, they won't touch this stuff with a 10-foot pole. But because it's, in a way, it's part of the culture. Right. Uh, We will, we would you know, we were going to help you. And he looked over at me and John sitting there on the side and he pointed his finger to the, he said, and you two are going to manage these cases. We said, yes, sir. And uh, that's how it began. You know, we began investigating all these different cases that a lot of them were life changing. They were something out of, you know, in some cases out of a horror movie. But one of the things that John and I would never do was to, show fear with these cases you know we've been trained as SWAT officers and with SWAT yeah there can be an element of fear when there is someone shooting at you but you got to keep your cool and rely on your training 
to get you through that. And that's what we did is that some of these cases involving spirit activity or witchcraft or demonic things, it'll try to instill fear in you. Yeah. And you just can't give in to that. You know, you have to, John and I both have had a strong spirituality and faith in our creator from the time we were little boys ever since we were young and I was able to growing up in Oklahoma, I disappear off into the woods, you know, on the weekends and from school and, and I wasn't scared and, and I would be out there playing until after it got dark, you know, my mom would be hollering at me, yelling at me to come in. And so I think that also played a very important role in, in investigating and dealing with these particular cases. Yeah, let's get into some of the cases that you put in the book. Uh, one of the ones that really caught my attention, it's one of the first ones that you put in the book, yeah. is uh, you responded to a ranch that had uh, sheep mutilations. Yeah. And I think it was like 26 sheep. Yeah. That was one of the early cases that I took, even before John and I were assigned to investigate the paranormal. So the tribe has their own veterinary program. And there was a veterinarian that was on scene, and I was dispatched to that location. I get there, and the veterinarian's there, and him and I talk. And the family was extremely upset simply because livestock, and, and in, in this case sheep, are a very, very critical part of their finances, and it's their livelihood. And they woke up to find all 26 head of their sheep in the corral dead and so in that particular case when I approached the corral as I was approaching the corral I could already get a sense that there was this wasn't just your average case it, there was something else uh, yeah. and and even notably there was the odor the smell was a sickening petroleum tinged smell um, if you've ever smelled a burning burning tires or something like that there was an yeah. element to it like that there was and it wasn't normal they, they shouldn't have been there you know um, that wasn't part of I was expecting to find you know a predatory kill mountain lions will get into a corral sometimes to kill many many sheep and and bobcats um, bobcats are really notorious for killing a whole flock of sheep, you know, simply because yeah. of that aggressive bloodlust kind of thing that goes on with a predatory animal like that. So I get up there and I'm looking for the entrails and the blood and there's none of that. There's none of that. All of these sheep within the corral, they're all laying there on their sides and I get to looking and crawl over into the corral and these sheep are slit from their up near their neck all the way to their groin in a wow. precise straight line. Yeah. And that's no small feat to cut through the wool of these sheep like that. And this was like, you know, I, I didn't know what could cut like that in such a precise straight line like that other than maybe some type of medical laser that you know would lay open the skin and the, the wool like that yeah and um it was just the strangest thing i ever experienced when it comes to livestock and that you know i grew up on a ranch in oklahoma my uncle's ranch and he had you know i grew up around cattle you know taking care of cattle on cattle ranch and, and yeah, I've seen a lot of, a lot of predatory kills and things of livestock, but I never seen anything like that. Not, not the entire sheep population within the corral, and no entrails or none of that, and no blood. And uh, it was the whole thing was just your mind is trying to wrap around what you're seeing because it don't make any sense. Right. And the other thing was the sheep dogs that look after the sheep wouldn't come anywhere near the corral. They they stayed away from that corral. 
and usually they're right right in there with the sheep. And the other thing is they also serve as kind of guardians or sentinels over those animals. So in the middle of the night, if all of a sudden you hear the dogs barking like crazy, you got some predatory animal that's trying to get to the sheep or something. And that didn't happen. The the family wasn't awakened, you know, throughout the night. And uh, until they actually got up in the morning and went out and found their sheep, all of their sheep did. So that was one of those, that was those, one of those mutilation, livestock mutilation uh, cases that was kind of baffling to me, you know. And yeah. everybody that I knew of that came out to that location and looked at him, you know, the veterinarian, <laughs> he didn't know, he didn't know what the hell to think about it. And they, they just had to end up, um, using a backhoe and burying all of those livestock. I think they might have burned them too, I think, before they covered them up. But. Yeah, what caught my attention is, like, you hear those stories about, you know, maybe one or two cattle mutilations or something, but not right. that many at one yeah, time. That, that is, many all at once. Yeah, it was. that was one of those cases. It was just mind battling, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I, you, you kind of spent a lot of time out in the desert area. Yeah. And yeah. I've I've heard stories about weird things in the desert. Um yeah. you know, of course skinwalkers and things like that, but being out there right. alone, um, did it did you ever get I don't know, spooked out or creeped out in different places, like just the energy was off or um or anything like that when you're out there by yourself? There are places where you know, there's obviously places like Sedona and what is known as Skinwalker Ranch, the Sherman Ranch up in Vernon, Utah, where yeah. there are different types of phenomena that is occurring in those locations. You'll have odd uh, electromagnetic frequencies and a lot of different energies swirling in those areas known as hot spots, or they'll have what's known as vortex and things of that nature. And there are those places that are known to have these strange phenomena and strange energies. One of the cases that I worked on was in an area known uh, by one of the maces there is referred to as Satan Butte. And yeah. um, there was an individual there who, uh, he was non-Indian, but he was married to a Navajo woman. And he, he lived there. He taught school in the, one of the local schools. And he contacted us and he was experiencing what he referred to as UFOs and these orbs flying into this Mesa, this Satan Butte Mesa. And he said it was doing it over and over, you know, at night. And he was trying to get even his wife's attention that this was happening. And she didn't really believe him. And he went out and got a digital camera and he caught pictures of this thing. And he contacted me and John and, he was having also seeing the shape shifting creatures or beings uh, during that time. And uh, they were disturbing the horses. Things was objects were coming around, disturbing their livestock. And so there are those areas like that. And I, later on, I found that particular location of that investigation was on the same longitude as the skinwalker ranch location so kind of puzzling you know it kind of makes you wonder people talk yeah. people talk about ley lines and things of that nature you know there's books written on it but you never know maybe there is something to that yeah i i had the pleasure of talking to uh gentleman who owns the ranch that butts up the skinwalker ranch yeah. um oh yeah and um uh, space wolf research i think this is mm -hmm. This stuff and um yeah they you know it's not just skinwalker ranch it's kind of that entire area right true um and there and there's there's other areas like that around the world i mean you got alaskan triangle and all these other triangles that we talk about all the time right. uh ryan burns was his name that i talked to that owns the yeah the ranch next door but he he had some incredible things happen oh they do as well they do it's not just the ranch it's it's that whole region up there has unusual energy and phenomenon about it you know, I, I, I've been, John and I have both been on that uh, Sacred Skinwalker Ranch 
television yeah. series and the Beyond Skinwalker Ranch series. Um, and I know for myself, you know, over the years of investigating this stuff, that whether it was already there or whether it's more developed today, having investigated all of this stuff, um, I'm sensitive to it. You know, I can I can go into a building that's uh, that's said to be haunted and I can tell if that energy inside that building is negative or if it's just neutral or benign or positive energy too. Um, I can sense that. And uh, when John and I walked the grounds of Skinwalker Ranch, um, we were afforded to travel wherever we wanted to on the ranch. And, and uh, there's definitely energies uh, there. and some are more notable than in places than, than others. So, but even in the outside area too, like you said, there's, there's places around that area that have the same kind of phenomenon that's, that's occurring there. Pretty interesting. Yeah. I guess you developed these over the years, but what tools did y'all necessarily have to like help people? Um, Cause I know, you, you know, you're talking about going out and investigating these things. Um, I mean, did you have people that, that you could, um, you know, send them to, yeah. um, whether it be medicine men or, or other people to come out and clear the land or, you know, help them in, in different ways? Well, John and I are not and never claim to have been medicine men or shaman or any of that. We yeah. have uh, relatives and friends who are medicine men. And I have a good friend that's a shaman that's not Navajo that, and these people are the ones we turn to when it's obvious that there is some type of activity going on. And we'll refer the victims or people that are experiencing this to those individuals and let them you know, work out what it is they need to do. And John and I really, for the most part, we're there to try to validate that something's going on something is of a paranormal supernatural nature and not just a natural yeah. phenomenon like radon gas or something of that nature that's naturally occurring and or like mental health issues or something yeah, exactly, or something exactly. Like mental health yeah. issues you know whatever it could be that could be the root cause of what people are experiencing so we try to go in you know, we're investigators. We were trained as through the law, uh, federal law enforcement training programs and centers as criminal investigators. So, yeah, over the years, we had worked with like Robert Bigelow's investigators um, with Bigelow Aerospace. They had investigators that assisted us on a number of cases. Plus, we turned to like MUFON and the International. UFO Congress, you know, their people have been investigating these phenomena for a long, long time. And yeah. we turned to them for their expertise, you know, in the very beginning in how to handle these kind of cases because it's not in the law enforcement manual. <laughs> right. You kind of have to mod modify your investigative techniques and uh, what works in law enforcement doesn't mean that it's always going to work investigating the paranormal or UFOs or whatever. And uh, so we began working with them. But when we first reached out to them, the people with MUFON, when they found out the investigations that we were doing, they were like, oh, my God, you guys have to put together a presentation. And uh, we would invite you to be speakers for our monthly group that we, that we that come together for Mutual UFO Network. And um, we were kind of taken back by it, you know. That wasn't, that was never our intent to get into that whole genre of speaking about this stuff. And, but we did put together a PowerPoint and we presented it to the Mutual UFO Network's monthly, monthly group. And when we did, it was, it was, um, Standing room only. I mean, it, the house was packed, and and the reception we got at the end was just 
you know, a standing ovation in that. And, and we were kind of shocked. And, but we knew that people were interested in it. You know, people yeah. had a curiosity with this stuff. And we could say that with, with some of these cases, they, they were real. These phenomena were unexplainable. And, and, uh, so yeah, it led to today, you and I talking and, yeah, I, now I have a book <laughs> that I've written that's coming out October 1st, The Paranormal Ranger, a Naval Investigator's Search for the Unexplained. So, kind of surreal. I, yeah. I had to pinch myself, you know. <laughs> the right. the heads of HarperCollins Publishing had watched television episode John and I had done with Netflix called Unsolved Mystery. Yeah. And when they watched that, the heads contacted me and John. They said, Oh my God, we watched your episode. We, we want to help you publish book based on this. Yeah. I jumped on it. I jumped on it and I worked at it diligently. And so it's coming out very soon. So yeah. And, and congratulations on being on the New York times top, yeah. uh, top books to read this <laughs> fall. That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's, again, I had to pinch myself. I, it almost don't seem real, but yeah. yeah, I'm excited about it. Yeah, I was I was really excited to to get the uh, one of, one of the perks of my job that I see because I read a lot of books because I have a lot of authors and so on is is getting the yeah. um, the proofs you know from the authors yeah. that other people don't get. I think that's pretty neat and oh yeah, and get to read it it's, before. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I've had the book for like two two months already, <laughs> so I've been itching to oh, talk really, to yeah. you. Yeah, and and to get the episode episode out, but uh. But yeah, it's. A, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, it's. I'm glad it worked out. And and so. and I think you know so many people are interested in it because you don't hear a lot of law enforcement officers anywhere talk about no. you know the paranormal cases and. They're out there 24 seven, so they do experience this stuff. Yeah, it's just the department's policy is not to be talking about it and and addressing. It. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, and and also I think it's a it's a credibility thing. You know, they don't want their credibility called into question because they're reporting well, paranormal things you know some cases that's probably true yeah it does happen so yeah and and for you to be in a unique position um because of you know the beliefs of the navajo and and it being you know part of the culture yeah um yeah right. but i people need to go out and, and grab the book it there are amazing stories in there and and uh thank you i always enjoy seeing seeing you and john both on skinwalker ranch uh, and, and then on uh, unsolved mysteries is great. And anything that I, that I see y'all on, it's just a uh, fascinating stuff. And you also, I mean, you, you gather evidence for some of these, like you've had pictures and, you know, right. and, and it's not oh, just yeah. all conjecture and things, you know, or, or, or just personal experiences. Um, I had four coins of port here in my house within the last three weeks. Oh, wow. So yeah. It's, and that original case was in 2009. Wow. And it's still happening to me this very day, uh, in, even in my bedroom, uh, where the coins will materialize out of thin air. And I just collect them, bag them, date and time them. And I've got a huge bag of coins today, <laughs> today, over the years. And it can happen anywhere. They happen when I travel to Scotland and Canada. And it could happen anywhere. Wow. And it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the book is out October 1st, and of course, it'll be Amazon, Barnes yeah. & Noble, and anywhere else fine yeah. books are sold. I'll have all those links in the show notes. And uh, cool. is there anywhere Great. anywhere that people can uh, connect to you if they want to, to directly connect through social media? Well, there is a podcast that I, me and Jonathan Dover and Michelle Miners do called Native Paranormal Crossroads. You can find that on YouTube, and you can reach us through that. And uh, the paranormal rangers there's a website uh, you know for that and so yeah you can reach out to us and you know maybe we could you and i and get together and do a part two there's a lot more information yeah yeah for so sure i'd, I'd enjoy that yeah so cool. all right stan all right thank you so much for coming on the show really appreciate it you're very welcome nice to meet you yeah very nice to meet you as well all right everybody y'all stay safe out there have a good day we'll see you next time thank you everybody Thank you for listening to The Unseen Paranormal. Join me next Wednesday with a brand new guest. And please rate, review, share, and subscribe on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. This helps more people discover the show. You can connect with me over on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or join us in the Unseen Paranormal Lounge group on Facebook. Until next time, remember, 
some of the scariest things are unseen. See the other side.